السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا We'll praise due to Allah alone We all praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leaves astray None can show him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, my dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of your program, Gardens of the Pious. Today's episode, by the grace of Allah, is an episode number 288, <coughs> and it is uh, 282, and it is the beginning of a new chapter, chapter number 69. Um, this chapter which is known as the recommendation of seclusion at times of corruption committed by the people of the world. Or what is known in Arabic as istihbab al-uzlati inda fasad al-nasi wa zaman aw al-khawf min fitnatin fi al-deen wa wuqo'in fi haram wa shubuhat wa nahwiha. I'd like to give a little introduction to this uh, topic before we indulge into it by discussing the ayah and the hadith which al Imam al Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, selected to list in this chapter, I'tizal al Nas. The original condition is the recommendation to mingle with people, is to enjoin what is good, is to forbid what is evil, is to exchange gifts, is to exchange visits, is to visit those who are sick, is to attend people's lawful parties, is to accept their invitations. Here is a aqiqah, there is a walima, there is a feast, somebody is inviting you for a cup of tea uh, to visit with people. In the hadith, Allah the Almighty on the Day of Judgment will call upon the believers, certain believers whom Allah the Almighty will say, Aina al mutahabina fi, Aina al mutajadisina fi, Aina al mutazawirina fi. What are those who used to love one another for my sake? What are those who used to visit one another for my sake? What are those who used to sit together with one another for my sake? Why? When they show up, Allah the Almighty will declare, Today I shall shelter them in my shade when there will not be any shade but His. And obviously I explained so many times before that this is a shade that Allah will create on the day to shelter certain people, the believers, those whom Allah loves, and the 70,000 and with everyone 70,000 uh, who will be sheltered on the day from the sun, from the heat and they will not experience any hardship on the day. Why? One of the qualities of those people visiting with people, mingling with the Muslim community, uh, going to non-Muslims in their localities, in their businesses, in their shops, in their homes, in their countries and inviting them to Allah the Almighty, going to the sinners and recommending for them to repent and inspiring them to come back to Allah the Almighty. And that was the attitude of our most beloved and our role model, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Don't you think that Mecca was so corrupt when the Prophet, peace be upon him, started his mission of calling to Allah? Of course it was so corrupt. What could be greater corruption than worshiping idols, than prostitution and adultery, than dealing with riba, than drinking. They used to do all of that. Then killing one's own daughter alive, burying her alive out of shame. All kind of corruption, you name it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, did not decide to isolate himself. Before he was appointed with the prophethood, he used to sit in seclusion in the cave for days, for weeks, and in Ramadan he will spend the whole day in the cave. 
But after he was commissioned with the prophethood, now you don't only worry about yourself. Qum فكبر وثيابك فطهر والرجز فهجر once يا أيها المدثر once يا أيها المزمل there is no more time for rest there is no more time for seclusion there is no time to isolate yourself from the community you have a very heavy task إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا we're going to reveal unto you a very heavy statement and you have to bear the responsibility and convey the message to people the messenger of Allah peace be upon him was opposed and was persecuted but that did not hinder him from giving da'wah from mingling with people he would go to them those who are coming to perform Hajj or Umrah or visiting for tourism or for trade and business he would offer them that I am the messenger of Allah I'm calling people to worship Allah alone not to worship idols to be monotheistic and most of them won't accept his invitation but once once in Al-Aqabah when he spoke to about six people and they liked what he said because they were coming from Yathrib they were neighbors to the people of Ahlul Kitab the Jews and they have heard things similar to that before so Allah opened their hearts to accept the truth and next year they came double the number and the Prophet Sallallahu sent with them the first ambassador in Islam Mus'ab ibn Umayr may Allah be pleased with him Mus'ab ibn Umayr did not take shelter rather he used to sit in the street and gather people and when Usaid ibn Hudayr then when Sa'd ibn Ubadah then when the chiefs the chieftains of Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj each one of them was very angry and they warned him that you either get out of our town or you will face a very severe consequence he says well what about something better than these two ultimatums I have something better for you another proposal why don't you try it what do you have Ya Sayyid Al-Aws oh the chieftain of Al-Aws what if you just sit down and listen to what I have to say if you like it fine then you can accept it and if you don't like it I promise I shall not bother you anymore and he's certain that what he's saying is to be liked should be liked it is the word of Allah the Almighty Usaid ibn Hudayr says with him a few minutes what does he say the Quran and he sold and he accepts Islam Sa'd ibn Ubadah sits with him with the same the same style he just invited him sit and listen and he accepts Islam and next year 72 people in addition to a few women are going to perform Hajj and give the Prophet Sallallahu the bay'ah it is the effort it is making an effort to mingle with people to tell them what is good and what is bad to enjoin what is good to forbid what is evil and it is our lagging this duty which kept this ummah inferior and when we make the least effort you see the results one of my students as I mentioned one of these episodes uh, she's a girl living in New York City and she shared with me how making a simple effort converted her from atheism she said myself and my entire family are hardcore atheists we don't believe in any religion we always believe that God is opium, is narcotics, is something to deceive people with, whether it is Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, there is no, there is no God, it's all fake. And she got in a cap, a yellow cap. In 15 minutes, she was in the cap. The cab driver gave her a little paper, a piece of paper, which have some websites talking about Islam Q&A about Islam and he started a conversation with her and she said sorry I'm atheist I don't believe in God he said okay at least think about it and there are some websites if you're interested look at them and here is my number she tells me that for some reason when I went home I checked out these websites a couple of websites and the more I read the more I felt attracted to that 
So I started reading and reading for two weeks. I devoted and I dedicated my time to read. In two weeks, I found the number of this guy and I called him up and said, I need to meet with you. Who was he? He was not a scholar. He wasn't a big sheikh. He wasn't a grand mufti. He is a cab driver. He is an ordinary Muslim. He made an effort. He made an effort. He didn't say, these guys are all going to hell. Let them go to hell. No. He's making effort to save people from hellfire. He's making effort to bring people to the Lord, to recognize his lordship, to show him servitude, to say thank you God for creating us and for providing us with our sustenance. And the foremost and the most important blessing is guiding us unto you. She accepted Islam and she's enrolled in an Islamic university and she's studying with me and she tells me uh, a few weeks ago Alhamdulillah Sheikh my mother accepted Islam too I'm working hard on my father to pray for me they were very hard headed but Alhamdulillah my mother accepted Islam so many examples like that some people choose nowadays to live away from people to isolate themselves and live in seclusion they don't even attend the jama'ah with people what is your excuse because there are a lot of fitan a lot of fitan somebody sees me traveling to Europe or to the States why you're going to these countries full of fitan and we're not going uh, to wear a pair of shorts or to wear a swimming suit and go to the beach we're not going to take pictures we have a goal we would like to inform people about Allah the Almighty if this is the goal then your journey is legitimate this is fi sabilillah this is going fi sabilillah azza jal but you don't comprehend your deen you don't understand when should you mingle with people and when should you slow down when should you isolate yourself so first of all the original condition is to mingle with people is to be proactive is to make an effort and this little effort of use could be very productive if you are sincere by the will of Allah. Then, guess what? Not only the person will be saved, as the Prophet ﷺ said when this young Jew accepted Islam before his death, the Prophet ﷺ remarked saying, thanks to Allah who saved him from fire through me. So he saved a human being from entering hell fire forever because if he did not make that effort, and if this young man died as a non-believer, he would end up in hell. This is what our book says. This is what our God says. But he made an effort. Despite all the obstacles, his father is sitting next to him, and he's a young man, he's a youth, and he's sick, but the Prophet ﷺ did not lose a minute. Ya ulam, O young man, say, La ilaha illallah so that you'll be saved, you shall enter paradise. This is number one, saving people from hellfire. Number two, the amazing hadith, the great glad tiding, that if Allah guides through you one person that is better for you than the entire world and what it contains, what could be better than that? When you understand that, going out, making an effort to talk to people, whether a person who is a non-believer entirely or a person who happens to be born in Islam but he's not practicing I don't see any difference both need help both need guidance both need your assistance why are you staying at home why are you isolating yourself from people and mingling with them oh, it's a time of fit and trial not yet the original condition is to mingle with people this is the greatest quality of this ummah which made it superior because they are proactive they enjoy what is good they forbid what is evil they then say it's none of my business they care about others they care about non-muslims they care about atheists they care about every living creature they want everyone to be saved. That's why this ummah, Allah made, it, made them khair, better. Khair ummah, the best of nations to be produced. Subhanallah. But sometimes seclusion 
becomes a strategic choice. I don't say that is during certain time that it will come in the future. That is true. But also, it may happen temporarily in some places and during some times. So in this case, it is recommended to stay away, to safeguard yourself and your deen from the trials, from the fitting. And it may happen in a certain locality or a certain event. يعني, you, as a student in a high school, and now everyone is graduating and they threw a bachelor party or a graduation party and you all know a lot of filth will take place in this party. And you can be involved in fornication and you can end up drinking. Oh, I ain't drink, but I'm just having fun with them. No. Isolating yourself from them is the ultimate choice. There is no other choice. There is no good and better. There is only one choice, which is to isolate yourself from the evil company, from the bad people. During the trial, the calamity which took place between some of the companions and each other, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and their followers, may Allah be pleased with all the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Some of the companions of Rasulullah chose not to take side. Why not? Because they said this is a typical fitna. Both are companions and were afraid to be involved in bloodshed. Even though the case was obvious, but it was a choice of some of the very respected companions. Because of their understanding from the Prophet ﷺ, whenever there is a fitna, the one who is standing is better than the one who is walking, and the one who is sitting is better than the one who is standing, and the one... Why? To slow down your movement towards the fitna and your involvement to stay away from that. Abu Aliya says, I used to be a young man, and my love to fight for the sake of Allah was greater than loving the most delicious meal, eating the most delicious meal, eating and drinking. So I put on my armor and uh, uh, prepared my weapons, jumped on the back of my horse, and I went to the battlefield. Sufin. Then I stood between the two lines, the two rows, the two camps. إِذَا كَبَّرَ هَؤُلَاءَ On this camp, Ali ibn Abi Talib and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Whenever they make takbir, Allahu Akbar, the other camp, they make takbir, they reply by saying, Allahu Akbar. And it was funny, whenever it was uh, the, 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 the prayer time, they prayed all together. So he said to himself, they make takbir, and those guys make takbir. They make tahleed, they say, La ilaha illallah. And the other party make tahleed, they say, La ilaha illallah. So, whom shall I kill today? I mean, whom is that person which, if I kill, I would be killing an unbeliever. I would kill somebody for the sake of Allah. So, before the end of the day, I decided to withdraw. That's, that's a choice during the fitna. When the case is vague, when the case is not clear, to you okay others the case is very clear to them and they were so determined and that's why they participated Ammar ibn Yasser may Allah be pleased with him and the Prophet sallallahu said to him the case was very clear to him may Allah be pleased with him the catch in all of that brothers and sisters is that if you fear indulging into the fitna whether the fitna is temporarily because of a place or because of the time, or because of the era, like we're living in an era which is full of corruption, then this chapter will assist you to walk uh, through the fitna. We'll walk you through it, and we'll help you to avoid it, and we'll teach you what to do. So what does the chapter talk about? The recommendation of seclusion at times of corruption uh, committed by the people of the world, or in case of fear of trials, calamities concerning the deen, which may ruin one's religious commitment, and out of fear of falling into haram or doubtful matters, etc. Okay? Um, the first reference is 
an ayah uh, of Surah Azariyat, verse number 50 of Surah Azariyat. I love this verse so much. In this verse, Allah the Almighty says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ What does it mean? Al-Firar means to flee, to run off, to run away from something in case of fear. فَفِرُّوا فَفِرُّوا So, flee to Allah. Okay, that is understood. Flee to Allah. From whom? From Allah. فَفِرُّوا إِلَى الله. From Flee from his torment. Flee from his punishment. Flee from his anger. Towards his mercy. Towards his pardon and forgiveness. Verily, I am, Muhammad peace be upon him, a clear warner to you from him. Very comprehensive verse, very clear message. Normally, when you're afraid of something, you run in its opposite direction. If something is chasing you, you don't run towards it. You try to avoid the confrontation, right? If you're afraid of a dog, if you're afraid of somebody who's chasing you, you run away from them. Only Allah the Almighty is the one whom whenever you fear him, you run towards him. And in, uh, only Allah the Almighty is the one whom we are commanded in case of fear to run towards him. We fear him. Yes, we fear him. And we studied a whole chapter how to keep balance between hope and fear. So if you are afraid of Allah, and you should be afraid of Allah, you should be afraid of his punishment, you should be afraid of his anger, if you commit sins, what should you do? Flee from his punishment to him. Go to Allah, go to his mercy, go to his forgiveness, go to his pardon. How would that be achieved? By rushing to, for, to repentance, to repent to Allah, by rushing to seek forgiveness from Allah the Almighty, by rushing to uh, abstaining from that which angers Allah the Almighty. And this is how you reconcile, and this is how you fix your problem. So you flee from Allah towards Allah the Almighty. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inni lakum minhu nadhirun mubeen. Indeed, I am Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a clear and a plain warner to you from him. He sent me to you to guide you as how to flee, how to run away from the punishment, how to run away from the anger of Allah the Almighty. When does Allah the Almighty get angry with people? When they disobey him. When they reject his message, when they cross the red lines, okay, in this case Allah the Almighty, does he seize the sinners with his punishment immediately? Does he seize the criminals with his punishment, with his torture innocently? No, he doesn't. Rather, he gives warnings and he gives respites and he may give some worldly punishment in order to make the person assess himself why did I go wrong what did I do in the case of the Pharaoh with Musa السلام, Allah the Almighty tested them with seven uh, ayat some of these ayat calamities sending the lies upon them everyone was afflicted with lies in their clothes in their hair and their arm and in their in their in their bed in their food so the Pharaoh said he begged Musa Peace be upon him. If you ask your Lord to dismiss and to take away the lies, Bani Israel. I promise you, I'll let you take Bani Israel and just go. So Musa alayhi salam invokes Allah and Allah gives him a relief and takes away the lies. But again, they insist in their disbelief and insist on torturing Bani Israel and opposing and chasing Musa alayhi salam. Another test, another calamity, the frogs, al-dafadi'ah, with them. Subhanallah, one thing after another. These are all tests and trials. Famine is one of the tests and trials which Allah the Almighty bring upon people in order to take heed. 
in order to take heed. That's why during a famine, whenever there is a drought, we are ordered to pray Salatul Isisqa. And what do we do? We flip our clothes inside, outside. Why? We tell Allah Almighty, we're free from our sins. We disown our disobedience and we are free from any power. We're asking you through your power, through your help to pardon us, forgive us and send back the rain. So they go to Musa السلام, every time. The Pharaoh and the chiefs and uh, Musa السلام, asks Allah and look how merciful is Allah. One ayah after another, one test after another. And he is so merciful that he uh, relieves them and he takes away the calamity but no changes whatsoever nothing happens so he sends another ayah and another ayah and afterward whenever Allah the Almighty it was time to destroy the Pharaoh and his host look at this they were so stubborn they saw Musa السلام, striking the sea opening dry roads in the middle of the sea and the waves on both sides 12 dry roads in the middle of the Red Sea and it's another miracle but they neglected all of that and they insisted on chasing Musa alayhi salam they, they still believed in the Pharaoh so stupid after seeing all of that and that's why they deserve the punishment when any person reads a story from beginning to end they say yeah Allah is so patient he is the most patient. Look at Allah's patience. He gave them respite for so long for the case. Now they deserve to be drowned. And that's why when the Pharaoh was being drowned, Musa السلام, was saved. And the Pharaoh, while he was being drowned, every time he tried to say, Every time he wanted to say, I believed, I believed in God, I repent. Gabriel, peace be upon him would fill his mouth and nose with the salt water so that he would not get to say it. You don't deserve mercy. You don't even deserve to say La ilaha illallah before your death. You don't deserve that. So what happened in Surah Al-An'am in Ayah number 43? Allah the Almighty says, فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا وَلَكِنْ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ it's like Allah is telling us these tests and calamities which Allah sends upon us is to remind us, hey, wait a minute, you're off the road, get back. You know, if you're driving on the highways in, in North America, uh, uh, you know, in the States and in Canada, long extended highways, huge highways, and subhanAllah, uh, you can actually sleep while driving because they're so nice, very smooth, and uh, nothing to interrupt your driving so you may fall asleep and that's why on the shoulders they have made some grooves so that when you drive it will create noise in case that you swerve right you swerve left or you go off the road it will create noise in order to interrupt your sleep alert you and say, wake up you're about to go down you're about uh, to go off the street or off the road and these system trials, Allah the Almighty, create for people in order to be reminded. But they are not reminded. So Allah the Almighty says, فَلَوْلَا إِرْجَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا They should have, after being tested with our bas with our punishment, تَضَرَّعُوا They should have humbled themselves. But instead, قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ The hearts have become even harder. وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ and as shaitan said it, made, as, uh, Satan made what they used to do seem fair to them. And as a result of that, فَقُطِعَ دَابِرُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قُطِعَ دَابِرُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا After they have consumed all the chances, Allah the Almighty uprooted them. And الحمد لله for uprooting the wrongdoers. So brothers and sisters, فِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Flee unto Allah. From whom? From Allah, from His punishment, from His anger, to His mercy, to His forgiveness, and to His pardon. By repenting, by begging Allah for forgiveness, by correcting yourselves before it is too late. And do whatever it takes in order to achieve that. 
uh, sever your relationship to the evil company if you think that that is the only way to get back on the right track. Um, avoid mingling with people whom you know that they will mislead you and they will take you down and you normally get sucked in in their company because you cannot resist their influence and their pressure. فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ We'll take a short break and inshallah afterward we'll begin discussing these beautiful ahadith in this magnificent chapter. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk. I could agree that uh, institutional racism does exist um, and uh, to be precise, uh, we should uh, define institutional racism mm -hmm. and that is um, uh, hidden or non-apparent racism within uh, an organization or an institution. Um, I have witnessed it, me being uh, half Saudi, my last name is Arab. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to the States back in 2002, after the incidents of 9-11, um, I did uh, face uh, some racism. I think it can be what you do but in the sense of without thinking. The things you do naturally without having to stop and think, they just come out. Okay. You know, the, 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 this innate nature of you and uh, how you think and, what, and, and, your, and the way you see things. Can, we can get your insights on the two different countries, inshallah, further on into this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mamadou, if I can come to you, uh, what's your thoughts on institutional racism, especially in the UK? Do you think it's really prevalent there? The way we live, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of a combination of two things. The, uh, our language and then our what we believe in so if we have got a language without believing in something so it will be useless so we have we have we have, we have to get like both things going together I'm calling your name. Now that we know more about da'wah, what would you say are the characteristics of a da'i? Sincerity. Sincerity? Yes? Good relation with Allah. Good relation with Allah. Okay. Patience. Yes, sir? Good manners. Good manners. And there is much more to that. Join us in our program, the Da'wah Workshop, by your brother, Dr. Rayyan Fozi Arab, so that we could talk more about Da'wah exclusively on Huda TV. <laughs> It's calling us to establish this hiwa, this dialogue between ourselves and between the non-Muslims. To use hikmah. The waves are coming. You're trapped. Fitna every is coming everywhere. How, how can I get out of this fitna that I'm in? Ah, uh, send me the rope. Why did Allah send the Quran to you, to all of mankind? As a source of guidance, as a, as a kitab, a blessed book to be reflected upon. And secondly, the bath, the resurrection. Prepare yourself for your Qiyamah when you're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Aqeedah, this is the Qur of Aqeedah, this is the focus of the Qur'an. They want these dialects and these slangs to spread so the Arabs themselves can't even understand the Qur'an properly. This is, a this is a choice you have to make now. Because once the angel of death comes to you and takes your soul, there's no turning back, there's no other choice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. 
Uh, I'd like to remind you with our phone numbers, area code 002, then 02385531 or 132, and the email address is huda.tv. Okay, brothers and sisters, the first hadith we have in uh, this chapter is hadith number 596. The hadith is narrated by one of the great companions, who is also one of the ten heaven pound companions, that is none other than Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu qal sami'tu rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul inna Allah yuhibbu al-abda al-taqiyya al-ghaniyya al-khafi again very lovely hadith inna Allah yuhibbu al-abda al-taqiyya al-ghaniyya al-khafi rawahu muslim Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Indeed, Allah loves a servant who is pious, free of all wants, and unnoticed. Okay, we would like to explain, because some of these terms do not really express the Arabic meaning which the Prophet Sallallahu have meant in the hadith and we all know that Arabic language is extremely rich so that's why we do sharh an explanation in order not to leave you alone with a word which is uh, unexplained for instance <coughs> the meaning of free of all wants and unnoticed what do they mean <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Verily Allah the Almighty loves And that affirms for Allah the Almighty The trait of loving And the Quran is full of verses Explaining whom does Allah love Yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu So Allah loves the believers Allah loves al-muttaqeen Allah loves al-muhsineen You know and also there is the opposite. Wallahu la yuhibbu. And Allah does not love. Yani he doesn't like. Yani he hates whom? Al-zalimeen, the wrongdoers, al-kafirin, the non-believers, the rebellious, and so on. So this is the first benefit. To affirm to Allah what he had described himself with. The trait of love. Yuhib. Allah loves. Loves whom? The very first quality, al-abd. Some people may think al-abd is a subject, and then the traits and the qualities will follow. No, al-abd too is a quality. What is the meaning of al-abd? <clears throat> al-abd means a servant, a servant of whom? Of Allah, a servant of Allah. And by the way, the highest rank ever a person can achieve in uh, in, in the ranks of coming close to Allah is al ubudiyah And if you remember, whenever Allah the Almighty praised His Messenger, peace be upon him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the context of confirming the sacred journey at night from Mecca to Medina, then ascending to heaven, he chose for him a title. What was the title? Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنوريه من آتيا Glory be to the one Praise be to the one who have taken his servant Muhammad peace be upon him his servant for a night journey from the sacred masjid in Mecca to the place which we have blessed the area around which is Jerusalem and Masjid Al-Aqsa the farthest mosque which we bless the entire area around it in order to show him some of our signs some of our ayat okay so he chose for him a title that suits the occasion the greatest title is abd and the greatest name is abdullah or abdul rahman showing servitude to allah to the most beneficent or to the most merciful so abd Allah loves the one who shows servitude to him. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-abda. And subhanallah, 17 times 
every day we praise Allah, we exalt Allah and magnify Allah, and then we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ It is only you whom we worship. It is only you whom we show servitude. And it is only you whom we seek help from. Because al-isti'ana is an act of worship. Al-du'a is servitude. Begging Allah to fulfill your need is an act of worship. Seeking the help of Allah is servitude. So al-ubudiyah is a quality that Allah the Almighty loves in his servant. So he loves the servant who is what? Taqi. Oh, I know taqi means pious or righteous. What is the meaning of taqi besides being pious or righteous? How can a person become taqi? How would you achieve this level of taqwa? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, اتَّقِ الْحَرَامَ تَكُنْ أَعْبَدَ النَّاسِ this is a hadith which is narrated by Abu Hurairah. May Allah be pleased with him. اتق الحرام تكن أعبد الناس. Oh, so a worshipper or a person who is abdul lillah or shown servitude to Allah isn't only by doing the rituals, by only praying too much or fasting too much or um, um, you know giving in a charity so much. No, this is good and great, but. What makes a person a true pious person is abstaining from what is forbidden. Avoid what is forbidden. You will become the most devout worshipper. You will become the nearest to Allah. By simply avoiding what is forbidden, yes. Whether of earning, whether of eating and drinking, food consumption, whether of uh, what to wear, whether of transgression against others physically, morally, or financially. By avoiding that, you're capable to do it. By avoiding that, you are a true devout worshiper. Yeah, we need to spread this meaning, please. You deal with a lot of people who pray a lot and they fast a lot. But oh my God, once you deal with them in business, you regret. Why? Because money talks. They give precedence to interest, to profit, to money, to finance. So this is not a true worshiper. This is not a true worship. Inna salata tanha anil fahshay al munkar. That's why we pray. In order to hinder us from going into, you know, the bad ways, illicit activities, committing evil, staying away from sins, al salah helps to achieve that. Helps to achieve distancing yourself from all kind of evil that is al salah. But if it is not doing any of that, if it is not doing any of that, you pray and you steal. You pray and you know what else you do. Then what kind of benefit did you earn? from praying and uh, you know standing up and bowing down and prostrating yourself so at as the prophet sallallahu said ittaq al haram takun a'bad al nas okay uh, what about al ghani al ghani the word ghani means rich in arabic if you type in the dictionary if you google the word ghani means rich but the definition of ghina, the definition of richness in Islam, and according to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, is different. Not only that it is different, it is on the contrary. What do you mean? A person whose pockets are empty could be rich? Yes, sir. And a person who is a multi-millionaire or billionaire could not be rich? Yes, indeed. How is that? The Prophet ﷺ defined richness as follows. He said, "Lays al ghina an kathrat al arad." Al ghina, richness, is not achieved by possessing uh, too many properties, so much wealth, very fat bank account, 
and uh, investment here and there. No, it is not by your positions because there are a lot of people who have been uh, blessed or tested with wealth, properties, and positions, and they are not content. They feel like if they stop working, they would lose everything. So they devote their entire lives from morning till the time they go to sleep to work. They give Allah no right. They don't spare any time to pray. And their life is always based on fear. They're afraid that the stock market may be affected, the shares may be, um, you know, anything may happen to them. Uh, their mind is always working. And when they see somebody else have anything that they don't have, they envy him. But you have a lot. When they see somebody smiling, they envy them because they are happy. So this person is an envier. This person is not content. No matter what he has, he doesn't feel satisfied. He doesn't feel free from all wants. He's always wanting things. ليس الغنى عن كثرة العرب ولكن الغنى غنى النفس. The true richness is the richness of the heart. Is when you feel content. Is when you feel happy with Allah the Almighty. When you don't feel any need from anyone other than Allah the Almighty. Some people are middle class. But they're living fine. But he likes to befriend this person because he's rich. Why do you befriend him? Only because he's rich. Because he may give me a gift. I may in time of need ask him for a loan. He would be the only person who can assist me and so on. So his reliance is on a human being like him who may die at any moment, who may lose everything that he has in any moment, this person, this person is not rich. And the person who has a lot and he's always wanting more is not rich. Then the third quality is al khafi Khafi means, literally means hidden. What does it mean hidden? He hides from people. He doesn't pray in congregation because he doesn't want anyone to notice him or to recognize him. No, no, no. Khafi, he is not noticed, unnoticed. Whenever it comes to doing good deeds, he likes to do those good deeds in private so that no one would praise him. No one would observe what he's doing. It doesn't please him to see people admiring him, saying, he is a pious person. He is a righteous person. He is the most righteous person. He is the most knowledgeable person. He doesn't feel happy to be admired by that. He likes to keep it between him and Allah the Almighty. Our predecessors have taught us a lot in this regard. He is Zainul Abidin bin Ali. May Allah be pleased with him, his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather. That for years people don't know that he was a person who was carrying the sacks of flour over his back and drop them in front of their doors on regular basis for years. Nobody knows who's providing them with this welfare. Only when he died, this provision was interrupted. And when they come to wash his body, they saw the scars against his back. Are they figured out? It doesn't matter if people figure it out by accident. He did not mean to reveal it. He did not intend to tell people, look what I do. al khafi that's why the best prayer after offering the Father prayer is Qiyamul Layl. Why? Because it's supposed to be in the hidden, in the darkness, in the privacy of your room, in the privacy of your house. It's not in public. Nobody knows about it. And if you pray for an hour or two or three or a whole night, nobody should know about it unless if you volunteer to say, I didn't sleep well last night. Why not? Because I was praying all night. Then this is not khafi. One of the means of making you eligible to be sheltered under the shade of Allah on the day of judgment is to give in a charity in a hidden fashion so that your left hand wouldn't know how much your right hand has been given. May Allah the Almighty make us amongst al-abd, al-taqi, al-naqi, al-khafi. By that we come to the end of today's edition of your program. Gardens of the Pious and until next episode I leave you all in the care of Allah أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم
Shipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise. We're shipping cows, fire and stones, selling their best with the cheapest price. Rasulallah. 